thank you so much for that very warm and kind introduction. It's a real pleasure to be with you here today to share with you some of the research that we are doing at the Oxford Martin School, where we try to understand how technology is reshaping the world of work and what that might mean for the future. Because as many of you will have noted, there's a lot of concern about artificial intelligence, smart robots, autonomous vehicles, and so on, taking over jobs. And some are even talking about a fourth industrial revolution. And to economic historians like myself, that's strange, because to us, the first industrial revolution was one of the greatest things that happened in history. It was the time when the mechanized factory transformed the world by displacing the artisan shop, allowing us to produce more with fewer people. And that set in process or in motion, a process whereby we shifted in from the domestic system to factories and eventually into air-conditioned offices. I mean, it's quite striking how much working life has improved as well, even as we gotten richer. But despite this, this automation anxiety tends to reoccur. And if we zoom in, actually, on the first industrial revolution, uh, which uh, set the wheels in motion for this, what we find back then is that there were very different attitudes to technology as well. Benjamin Disraeli, before he became Prime Minister of Britain, wrote a book called Corningsby, in which one character remarks that I see cities people with machines. Certainly Manchester must be the most wonderful place in modern times. At the very same year, Friedrich Engels published his book on the conditions of the working class in England. And needless to say, he had a very different take on what machinery was doing to people. He argued that it only serves to degrade people by putting them in the repetitive motions of machinery, which he deemed to be unnatural. He argued that it deprives people of their jobs and, and incomes, uh, and would eventually solve in uh, a working class revolution, and which he famously predicted along with uh, Marx. And I think it's important to remember that at the time Engels was writing, he was actually fairly on target, because even as the British economy took off, for around seven decades, wages were stagnant in Britain. They were probably f even falling at the lower end of the income uh, distribution. And as middle-income artisan jobs were automated away, a lot of people resisted the force uh, of the factory. The Luddites, who famously went out and smashed machinery, were not the ones who stood to necessarily benefit from it, even though their children and grandchildren eventually would. So, in a sense, their opposition to it made sense. Now, you may wonder where I'm going with this, and I'm not certainly not suggesting that we are about to experience the same episode all over again. But I think it's noteworthy that levels of income inequality, at least in frontier economies like the US and Britain, but also to some extent in Sweden, are approaching levels not seen since the first of the Industrial Revolution. And clearly, the driving force behind it is no longer the mechanized factory, but it has to do with technology. It has to do with the declining cost of computing power, which promises to replace workers in a growing uh, set of tasks and activities. And you might, of course, say, well, we have you know, seen this process for some time now. The first electronic computer, after all, was invented back in 1947. Uh, but the ENIAC consisted of some 18,000 vacuum tubes. It couldn't have been fit into this room. And as a consequence, because it was bulky and the adoption rates were so low, it had no impact on the workforce whatsoever. 
Uh, it was really only with a microprocessor and the personal computer that uh, computerization really took off around the 1980s. And as it did, it certainly had both winners and losers. Well, we see that people with a college degree have seen their wages increase since the 1980s. We also see that prime-aged men who used to take jobs in factories before robots entered uh, them uh, are increasingly see, feeling the pressure. And wages in the US, um, in particular, uh, have been declining by some 30% for men without a college degree. And it is important to remember that while if you look at things like the unemployment rate before the pandemic, things were looking pretty good. Well, it was looking pretty good on average. And as we all know, if you put one hand in the freezer and another, the other in the stove, you should be feeling quite comfortable on average. But we know from experience uh, that that is not the case. And the same can be said of uh, the labor market. There were pockets of unemployment and non-employment, particularly among this group, and especially in places uh, that have been severely hit by globalization and automation. In fact, what we see is that where robots entered the factories, you see increases in unemployment, but you also see a lot of bad social consequences of it as public serious services deteriorate, as people, you know, few people take taxes, uh, and quite naturally, perhaps, people start to look into more radical alternatives politically. And one thing that we do see very clearly in the data is that where automation was more pervasive, President Trump won more votes. And we're seeing something actually similar in Sweden, uh, I should say, with the Swedish Democrats. And the key concern is, of course, that we've seen nothing yet, right? This is just looking backwards in the mirror. Uh, and as I'm speaking here, a lot of technological progress is happening right now, particularly in the domain of machine learning and artificial uh, intelligence, which promises to expand the potential scope of automation beyond these routine repetitive tasks where you need a computer programmer to specify what the machine should do with any, uh, any given contingency. Today, machines are increasingly capable to learn from the set themselves from the data trails we leave behind. And this is what's driving much of the progress in autonomous vehicles, in medical diagnostics, and uh, in machine translation uh, as well. That said, there are a number of things where even sophisticated algorithms still struggle. Those domains have, generally speaking, to do with creativity, complex social interactions. Robots tend not to do well in unstructured environments like our homes. The automated cleaner is probably one of the last things we're going to see. And they tend to also do quite poorly when it comes to complex social interactions. I think the state of the art here is probably best described by these Lobner Prize competitions, which are essentially Turing test competitions, where chatbots try to convince human judges of them being human. And at the end of the conversation, uh, the judge has to decide whether they're chatting with a human person or with a chatbot. And some people argue a couple of years ago that it was a breakthrough when one chatbot managed to convince 30% of human judges of it being a person but it did so by pretending to be a 13-year-old Russian orphan boy speaking English as a second language with no understanding of English culture. And if you think about the variety of much slightly more complex social interactions that you do in your daily jobs, where you try to sell something, persuade somebody that you're right, motivate members uh, in your team, and so on and so forth, right? Machines are nowhere near being able to replace us in those uh, type of tasks. That said, though, there's a number of jobs which are not that intensive in either creativity, complex social interactions, and complex perception and manipulation tasks. When we did uh, a study uh, almost a decade ago now uh, and looked at uh, 702 occupations and their uh, susceptibility to automation, we find that roughly half of jobs 
are not very intensive in those tasks. And one of the most peculiar findings was that we found that fashion models are actually highly susceptible uh, to automation. And my friend Ken Kugier, the economist, he used to tease us for this, right? He thought it was the most silliest, the silliest finding uh, ever. So it'd be fun to point out more recently that the fashion models that you see on these pictures here actually don't exist. They've been generated by what's called generative adversarial networks. They have their own Instagram. Uh, gram accounts, and they're already uh, being used in production. So machine learning is making some quite unsuspected uh, inroads um, right now. Now, that said, it's not the you know, skilled uh, higher education jobs that are most exposed to automation as is commonly portrayed. It's not doctors and lawyers. Yes, some tasks like medical diagnostics can be automated, as can some tasks in legal professions like document review. But if you look at the occupations that are most exposed to automation more generally, it tends to be the ones of truck drivers, receptionists, waiters and waitresses, and so on and so forth. And when President Obama's Council of Economic Advisers used our analysis and sorted them by income, they found that Occupations paying less than $20 an hour have a very high automation probability, over 80%, compared to those paying over $40. Right? So it's predominantly low-skilled, low-income jobs that are most exposed to automation going forward. Now, the economist Leontief once joked that if horses could have joined the Democratic Party and voted, what happened on the farms might have turned out differently. They might have used their political clout, their political voice, to vote down the mechanization of agriculture <laughs> and resist uh, the introduction of the tractor. And this is obviously a joke, but I think it illustrates an important point, which is that the Luddites that rioted during the first Industrial Revolution have no political voice. Property ownership was a requirement for voting, leaving most of the British population uh, politically disenfranchised. Today, that is obviously different, and if we want people to accept the creative destruction that technological change brings about, we need also to think about the transition, otherwise people might opt against it. And the recent survey in the US actually suggests that a majority of people now actually would favor restrictions on the introduction of machinery. I think po attitudes are a bit more positive than that in Sweden, fortunately. Um, but, you know, as I mentioned earlier, even in Sweden, this is being felt in the political landscape. The problem is not so much that no new jobs are emerging, they are emerging, but they're emerging in different places than they used to, and they're emerging in different places from where old jobs are often disappearing. You know, despite the sort of euphoria of the end of the 90s when digital technology was about to displace the office and we could you know, suddenly work from anywhere, remember that debate in the late 1990s, actually economic activity has become, if anything, more clustered uh, since then, primarily in skilled cities like Stockholm, like Copenhagen, like Silicon Valley, like London, and so on and so forth, whereas manufacturing towns are increasingly seeing more jobs disappearing. And the local service economy, we need to remember, is being hit by that as well. When one new tech job is created in a city like Malmö, that creates demand for bus drivers, taxi drivers, people working in grocery stores, restaurants, and so on and so forth. So this is also leading to a greater clustering of some of those jobs um, that relate to services that skilled people uh, then demand. Um, and a city like Malmö knows what structural transformation f feels like quite well, because it used to specialize in building ships. And when the shipyards closed down, there was a blow to the city. But, you know, we adjusted, right? The bridge to Copenhagen, for example, meant that people could stay put in Malmö, commute into Copenhagen, where there were more well-paying jobs, by staying put in Malmö, where real estate prices were cheaper, and spending their income here gave a boost to the local service economy in Malmö, and it's now become one of the most dynamic regions in Europe. And Malmö is back in a thriving uh, place in so many ways.
Uh, it's a brilliant, it's a brilliant success story. And obviously, an even more brilliant success story is that today you can also do the same thing, but save the commute, which means that this can also be done by many other places. We can use the remote work revolution because we now have the, many of the technologies to actually bridge many of these spatial income inequalities as well. And the topic of the coming presentations and session will be how that is actually changing the boundaries of how we work as well. Thank you for your attention.